the fairness of it, the love from it, and giving you maturity, allowing you to grow into a Christian that is mature and well-developed and rounded in his plan and his word, a servant ready to serve with the knowledge and skill that he relates to us in this beautiful letter. I thank him for it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. The first book of Samuel. Here we're in chapter 3. We got up and we're ready to continue on with verse 15. But Samuel is a very important book. It's a benchmark. You might say, well, what does that mean to me? It means a great deal. Let me tell you why. Samuel was the last judge before God to let man have a king. Israel had looked over at the Philistines and others. They had kings. Boy, they wanted their king. God was their king. They already had a king, a king that was able to perform miracles. The king's commands were passed on through the judge. Rebekah, Eli, Samuel, others. And they had a king that was protecting him as well as uh, if he had been there, visible to them, much as the kings of the Philistines and others. So, what do we have then? We have the benchmark that changes from a theocracy to a monarchy. Well, how does that apply to today? Well, they're going to have the first appointed king over Israel very soon in this book. And also, what that means to you today, these things are types and examples and a shadow of how it will be when the false king, that is to say the king of this earth age, the king of the air, the prince of the air, the prince taking his kingdom de facto when he sets foot on earth, instead of Jesus. But also, the true king that was set forth, the priest and the judge, that was set forth in the last lecture through Samuel. We see the fall of the Levitical priesthood through the sons of Eli and, yes, Eli himself. And God has promised, you will never have another person sitting on in, in my place as a judge or as a priest. And he appointed Yeshua, Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek, with the priesthood then flowing to the Zadok. I'm talking about the true priesthood. That type that was set forth. So you see the ramifications that come upon the world before the king is set in place. The first king of Israel. So it will be just before the king of kings is set in place. Therefore it makes it very important to you. What God will teach you in this lecture is that he keeps his word to the letter. He had promised that Eli and his sons would have nothing else to do. He told Samuel so in that night, not, not a vision, but literally speaking to him. Eli, having to tell Samuel that God's speaking to you, listen to him. So we pick it up after God had spoken to Samuel, saying, I will destroy Eli and his sons. We pick it up in verse 15. And Samuel lay... Unto the morning, this is after God spoke to him, and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. What did Samuel do? He was a doorkeeper. It doesn't matter what service or which part of the service that God gives you, thank him for it. Thank him for it. He will certainly elevate Samuel, but at this time he's the doorkeeper. Verse 16. And then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. 17. And, he, and Eli continued. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said to thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. Samuel, uh, Eli rather wanted to hear it, knowing it was from God and would appreciate it. God... Uh, God, do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. See, he knew it wasn't good. He knew it wasn't good. 
that if you try to hide anything, may the same be unto thee. Verse 18, And Samuel told him every whit. That's an old Anglo-Saxon word that means every little piece, every word. And hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. In other words, Eli was willing to accept whatever it was. Whatever God does to you, dear friend, is good. If you accept it, if you learn from it, for God uh, offends no one. God only issues that that is deserved, and Eli truly deserves what, it, what God is about to dish out. Because he is the judge and in charge of Israel that his own two sons rip them off, rape the virgin temple girls. It all happened under Eli's reign. Verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord um, was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. What word? God's word. Samuel understood that word. Samuel studied that, that that was passed on by the judges. The word of God. Do you? It's important to you. Verse 20. And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew, what Sam, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. God many times hides things in uh, the word. Dan, the judge, all the way to Beersheba. What does Beersheba mean? It is the well of the seven. What seven? The seven thousand. The seven forementioned in this book of Samuel. In that beautiful prayer and prophecy by Hannah, Samuel's mother. It also means the well of the oath. The oath of seven. The oath that God has made and will not go back on. That well that is the saving water, the water of life, which is the true priest to say Yeshua. Verse 21. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. What? Shiloh? What is Shiloh? It's rest. Who is our rest today? The true Savior, Yeshua. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord, not by vision. He taught that lad. Do you not see now that in the type that a small lad here became the last judge, a small lad became that type that was the Savior, the same as a small lad born of a virgin would ultimately be the living word, not one word falling to the ground, but being the word in its entirety, that is to say, Yeshua. How perfect the word of God. Chapter 4, verse 1. A lesson God shall teach you that he is in control. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer, that is to say, the stone of help. This place was not named until 20 years later when the victory would come and therefore named stone of help because Samuel was that stone of help in, in a sense. And the Philistines pitched in Apec. Apec meaning a fortress. Now let me ask you this. Samuel spoke the word of God, but did God send Israel against the Philistines? He did not. Did Eli order them out there? He did not. They simply went to war. Never go to war without the blessings of the Father. The following will happen every time, too. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. 4,000 Israelites Lay dead. Slaughtered. Do you know what the first thing they whimpered about? Listen to it, verse 3. And when the people were came, come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, 
it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. You see what's wrong with that? The Ark of the Covenant would save no one. Only God saves. They knew at this point that they had not acquired God's permission and or His order through a prophet, a judge, or anyone else to attack the Philistines. And now that 4,000 of them are dead, they want to get religious all of a sudden. They want to get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it out and let the Ark of the Covenant save them. Let's see if it will. Verse 44. So the people sent to Shiloh to the place of rest that they might bring forth thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli, Hophna, remember him? His name means trouble. <laughs> There's going to be trouble, all right. And Phinehas. Phinehas meaning what? Brass mouth, loud mouth, ratchet jaw, all talk. Two high priests of the Levitical priesthood that God has already removed were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now that would be quite a religious sight to see these two men that ripped the people off of their offerings, raped the virgins that the people and widows that the people sent to be temple servants, and now they're going along with the Ark of God to bring victory. And God has already pronounced a death sentence upon them. I would say Israel's in real fine shape. I see little difference today when people go to so-called men and women of God that do not even understand the scriptures of God and say, save us and lead us. Blind leading blind in many cases. Oh, there's some good teachers. Five, but they're rather far and few in between. Verse 5. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. They're working themselves up into a religious fervor. They really got religion going. You know, if the body moves and shouts and jumps and hollows and pitches, uh, that's very religious, quite a religious experience. It's not Christian and it's not of God. But it's quite a religious experience, but not God's religion. Six, and when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. They heard that that very religious thing was brought into the camp. Seven, and the Philistines were afraid. For they said, God is coming to the camp. <laughs> They're wrong. They are very wrong. God didn't come into the camp. Two bum priests, two robbing, thieving, raping, supposed men of God, rip-off artists of the people, were in the camp with the ark. God was not there. All right? God is coming to the camp, and they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Not uh, for the three days, they stated, a woe unto us. Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues of the wilderness. That's what this will do to us. Again, they're wrong. God's not in the camp. Nine. But they had one man that had a lot of common sense, apparently, that wasn't afraid to fight. I'm speaking of the Philistines. Yes, they're God's children as well. And this one states, Be strong and quiet yourselves like men. Do you know what this really says? Act like real men. Stand up. Stop whimpering. Oh, you Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quiet yourselves like men and fight. Act like men, in other words. Verse 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. You see, at least the Philistines had a decent leader. 
Israel didn't in this skirmish. And they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. That's 34,000 all told. See, the Ark of the Covenant alone did nothing. Oh, it worked them up in a religious pitch, but have you not seen people work themselves up in a religious pitch before and the Spirit of God wasn't there? <laughs> there was a spirit there, all right. A Babylon spirit that babbles, 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 and brings confusion. God is not the author of confusion, but peace. If I offend some and the shoe fits, put it on and wear it, partner. And mature in the Word of God. Verse 11. And the ark of God was taken. The Philistines took it. That's sad, friend. And the two sons of Eli, Hophna and Phinehas, were slain. God kept his word. He accomplished it through the Philistines. Verse 12. Let me tell you something. God always keeps his promises, friend. That's why this is important to you today. For this is only a type of what's about to happen. Where are you going to be? Will you be deceived? Or do you know and understand the letter that your father has written to you in love? Verse 12, And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army. Benjamin meaning the son of my right hand, or son of my sorrow. Uh, Benai changed to son of my right hand. And came to Shiloh the same day, with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. 13, And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching. He knew the battle was going on, and he knew probably the outcome because of what Samuel had heard from God. For his heart trembled for the ark of God, and when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out, The ark of God lost to an enemy. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the tumult was great. And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Verse 15. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old. The old man, ninety-eight years old. And his eyes were dim. He could hardly see. And, he could, and he, that he could not see. Which means he could see only very dimly. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the, out of the army. He fled all right good brave man and he said what is what is there done my son tell me about it 17 and the messenger answered and said Israel is fled before the Philistines and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people and thy two sons also Hophni and Phinehas are dead and the ark of the Lord is taken you know, Eli wasn't that concerned about his two sons. He wasn't that proud of them anyway. But the ark of God was his responsibility. 18. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck break. And he died. For he was an old man and heavy. And he had judged Israel 40 years. Most of the judges judged that 40-year period, even into the kings, the 40 years. 40, of course, being probation. He was overweight, and when he fell to the side on his head, it just broke his neck. But don't miss the fact that it, probably, it broke his heart long before his neck was broken. 19. And his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her, the delivery pains, the labor pains, 20. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood, the women that stood by her said unto her, 
Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was a very meaningful thing. And it was her husband and her father-in-law that had allowed its captivity. Verse 21, And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. You see, that being the meaning of Ichabod. The glory is departed. Or where is the glory? Because the ark of God was taken. And because of her father-in-law and her husband, and she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Bless your hearts. If you don't miss the main message from this particular chapter, Anytime you attend something without the glory of God and His blessings upon you, you're going to fail. And when God's glory departs you, repent and retrieve it. For without God's power and strength, a man can do nothing. Now what you're going to see is that had they been in God's way, had those two evil preachers been in God's way, there would have been no problem. Had the people truly followed God, there would have been no problem. For God will get the ark, God will retrieve the ark of the covenant without using the aid of one man of Israel. You understand? There will not be one piece of armor put in place for God to retrieve the ark of the covenant. What does that say? God doesn't need man's help, friend. God would rather do it through man and bless man while he's doing it, but God doesn't need man's help. So what is that lesson to you? Use God as your wall and allow him to help you. Do it humbly and give him your respect and your love. Now, let's watch that retrieval. Chapter 5, verse 1, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod, that's to say the fortified place. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Dagon means fish, a big fish. And so he was. It was their idol god. It was a fish, let's say, from above the waist up. Picture a mermaid, only a man. And it stood there, and they worshipped the thing. That was their God. Verse 3, And when they of Ashdod arose early in the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him up in his place again. Poor boy. In other words, God, God didn't use an army to come in and knock that dumb thing down in a prostrate, humble position. In other words, one God uh, showing respect and paying homage to another through the ark, putting the thing in that position. Verse 4, And when they arose early in the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands. That's a Hebrew idiom or figure of speech that means the ultimate in prostration before uh, God were cut off upon the threshold. Upon the threshold being the statement. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. That's only the fish part, friend. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. It scared them to death. They had just slew 34,000 Israelites. God didn't need their help. He run the whole bunch of them off, put the fear of God in them. Verse 6, by the hand of the, but the hand of the Lord. Who did this? Don't you miss it. It's no different today, dear friend. If God wants something done, He can get it done. People talk about, well, God's got to bring about a, an atomic holocaust to bring the end. God doesn't need man's trash and junk. 
nor will he have it. He'll have no part of it. He didn't mean need man's powder and explosives to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, nor will he to bring in and usher in the millennium age. Wise up, mature. Stop trying to improvise with man's toys. Yes, compared to God's power and might, even an atomic bomb is a toy. And boy, are some going to get it. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with imrods, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. Now, some people think that God doesn't have a sense of humor, and even at a time like this, I feel he does. Some people don't call hemorrhoids a very funny thing. Many might say, well, you mean that means hemorrhoids? That's simply an Anglo-Saxon, it's the ancient word for hemorrhoids. Be a little more specific, the Hebrew manuscripts and the Masera declare it as the... Um, Posterior, in the secret place. It means piles, friend. He placed them on the whole bunch. He didn't need any Israelite help doing it either. Now, some would say, well, that doesn't seem funny to me. Well, I, did, I think it did to our father. There's many other things. He could have put a pile on there. He could have put a tumor on their nose if he would have wanted to. But he put it where it counted, friend. Verse 7. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us. We don't want it with us, for his hand is sore upon us. And I imagine there was a lot of soreness upon them. And upon Dagon our God. He, doesn't only, he hasn't only done it to us. Look at poor old Dagon. Eight. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them. It's time for powwow, friend. And said... What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? Question. And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about into Gath. Gath being the wine press. There's going to be a little more pressing of the vine, friend. And they carried the ark of God of Israel about Thiva. Nobody wants it, friend. God's, God has no problem getting it returned. They're more than willing. They're looking for a place. Nine. And it was so that after they had carried it about, again, did God call an army? Uh-uh. The hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. And they had emroids, an ancient Anglo-Saxon word, Saxon being Isaac's sons, the house of Israel, for hemorrhoids in their secret parts. In other words, the posterior in the Hebrew that is not shown, but always covered. Piles. Ten. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. You know what Ekron means? Torn out by the roots, friend. And it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, this place where you tear it out by the roots, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, they have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. We don't want it. And they didn't enjoy the hemrods. Hemrods, that is. Hemroids. Eleven. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God of Israel. Get rid of it. And let it go again to its own place. That it slay us not. And our people, for there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. Now, God doesn't need your help or anyone else's. He'd love to have it. For his plan requires and he wishes that his servants be servants. You know, to be a servant, you must submit to he that is in charge of all things. And he that is in charge of all things is the same God that put these tumors where they really count on this entire nation that made them submit, that brought them in un under servitude themselves to God's will 
to find that when God is with the Ark of the Covenant, He doesn't need a man to see that the covenant is cared for, the, the Ark is cared for. He can care for it quite well Himself, or cause a, a nation of heathen to care for it gently and tenderly. Twelve. And the men that died not were smitten with emrods. And the cry of the city went up to heaven, Help us! In pain and misery, wanting only an answer, Where do we send the ark? How precious the word of God. And his manner and method of teaching that he doesn't need our help. And that without him you can do nothing, dear love. Not a thing. And with him you can do all things. You and our Father make a majority if He's touching you, if He's using you. Many people say, well, what can I do? If God has His hand on you, you can do a lot. God can accomplish anything He so chooses. I would hope that this would make you want to serve Him, our Father. For you see, it was not the Philistines' fault that the Ark of the Covenant fell to their hands. It was the fault of wicked priests of God. God could have slain the entire group, but he chose rather to slay some, no doubt deservingly, and to simply put a tumor that would be removed on the others to return and to make his point and to show that he is a father that loves and is in charge. Don't forget the moral. Don't forget the lesson. God loves his children and he wants to use them, but he doesn't necessarily need them. Think about it. Mature in his word. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment, please. Genesis, in the beginning. You know, if you don't understand the beginning, there's no way you'll be able to understand any of God's word. On two cassette tapes, we have the first six chapters of the book of uh, Genesis, uh, which cover this, the forming of the races. Did you know that God formed more than one race in the beginning? He certainly did, and he was proud of all of them. So many people overlooked that fact. What really happened in the garden? And what about those fallen angels that saw, that looked upon Adam's daughters and took them to wife? Are you familiar with why all these things were done? How about Cain? Why was he cursed before and marked before these six chapters uh, are completed. Uh, I think you'll find these two tapes quite interesting. They t go into detail of the world that was taken from the Hebrew manuscripts to help you have a better understanding of our Father's Word. I think you'll truly enjoy it. Uh, 